Welcome back to our PBS coverage. I'm Jeffrey Brown from the PBS NewsHour, and joining me now is Tom Brokaw. He's the author of six bestsellers, The Greatest Generation, of course, for which he's here at the festival to talk about, and also, more recently, A Lucky Life Interrupted, which chronicles his discovery that he had multiple myeloma, treatable but incurable form of blood cancer. We'll, so we'll talk about that. And of course, Mr. Brokaw, known best of all to many of us, certainly in the broadcast industry, for his many years at NBC News. So it's nice to talk to you. Thank you, it's good to be here. I'm, I'm kind of the outlier. You know, I'm, I'm the broadcast guy who, who also writes books, so. Uh, that's well, I, then, then it's nice to talk to you. I like talking <laughs> to the outlier. But also, I heard that you were one of the originals here at this book festival 15 years ago. David McCall and I were just talking about it. It was a very, it was a very memorable time. We were in black tie at the Con Library of Congress. The auditorium was filled uh, with uh, both American and then foreign representatives. Mm -hmm. uh, he read and I read, and then the next morning I went back to New York and I was still pretty exhilarated by yeah. it all. And on Tuesday morning, following that weekend, I woke up and got a call from the office that some small plane had hit the World Trade Center. Right. And my world went into turmoil, as it did for everyone else. And about three weeks later, I finally emerged from all of that and I tried to remember where I had been before 9-11. And it dawned on me, I'd been at the book festival and I yeah. called Mrs. Bush and she said, yes, it reminded me as well, she said, Earlier in that week, we'd had a state dinner for the president of Mexico, then the book festival. Yeah. I thought that's what being the president was all about, yeah. not about 9-11. Well, the, the, it's interesting. I mean, as we look back, the world changed, right? Uh, and yet, here we are 15 years later at a book festival, which is still thriving. Well, the way. book festival is thriving, and that the great strength of this country is that we do find ways to go on. Yeah. On the other hand, 9-11, kicked off what we're dealing with in the Middle yeah. East right now. Yeah. I mean, as we're sitting here talking about books, young men and women in uniform from this country are in Afghanistan and Iraq, yeah. and the war goes on. Let me ask you first about the greatest generation. Um, you could not possibly have imagined, I'm guessing, what this book, that book would do, right? No, I, except what, I, what you know, I'd like to think that I had that kind of clarity. Yeah. It took me a while to write it. I, the idea began to form in, uh, on the 40th anniversary of D-Day, yeah. but it was not until really the uh, 60th that it had taken hold, and that was 15 years ago. Yeah. Uh, I, I was born in 1940. My first memories of life were of that war. I was on an army base where my dad was. And, and then the 50s came along, and for working class families like ours, it was nirvana. My dad was making a good wage. You could think about right. sending me to college. Right. You know, I had a, a world open to me that we never anticipated. So the war receded. And then when I was anchor of Nightly News, I went for the 40th anniversary of D-Day and began to meet veterans of that invasion who looked exactly like my school teachers, like the businessmen on Main Street, like my parents' friends at the mm -hmm. Elks Club on Saturday nights. Yeah. And it turns out they were all uh, cut out of the same bolt of cloth. You yeah. know, they'd come out of the Depression, fought the war, won it, came home, didn't talk about it. And it began to take hold in my mind that this is a great generation. And I finally said on the air one day, I think it's the greatest generation. I mean, it certainly took hold. Something grabbed the moment or the readership to have the same feeling as you did, I guess. Well, I think two things happened. Uh, Ken Burns said to me later, because when he did the documentary on the World yeah. War II, he said, you gave them permission to talk. The veterans themselves had not talked about it. I have found that too. I mean, so that yeah. you, it's the same thing, right? They, they, yeah. they were of the generation where they did not really talk about no, it. No, it was too horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there were t memories were too hard yeah. for them. Yeah. And they all were worried about uh, like strutting around. They'd say, oh, I wasn't a hero. But the guy yeah. in the foxhole next to me, he was the hero, the guy who didn't come home. And then their kids were the boomers. And they, didn't ha they had no memory of the war because they were born after the war. And yeah. then they had everything going for them. They had money and they had cultural upheaval. Right. And when I wrote the book, now I hear, I must say 15 years later, two, three times a week, somebody comes up and talks to me. The most touching cases are women yeah. who had a hard time with their tough fathers, you know, who had an idea about what women should be like. Right. And they were pushing back against each other. And then they read the book and they understood their fathers better. And they come up to me now at age 52, 53, yeah, yeah. tears in their eyes yeah. and say, I didn't understand dad until yeah. you wrote that book. So part of it is you gave them that permission. That, that was the idea, giving them permission to talk about what had happened. To them. It was, and they, and they had, it took me three tries to get George Bush 41 to talk about it. I wrote to him and wrote to him and wrote to him. Yeah. And he's a reticent man anyway. Yeah. And then when he wrote to me, it was the most 
telling thing about he'd grown up, you know, in privilege, and then he was on a ship with guys who were talking about what was going on on the farm. Marriages were breaking up. He was an officer. He had to screen the letters. Right. And he said, I learned about life by being in World War II. The, the newer book is a, a very different, right? Very, very different. personal. Yeah, very personal. Now, was that harder to write when you are when you are the subject and it is such a subject? No, in many ways it was easier to write because I was, it began as a journal. Uh, I, got, I don't think anyone's ever prepared for the cancer diagnosis. And then I don't think anyone's really prepared for what that means <coughs> in your life. Mm -hmm. It takes it over. It yeah. takes over your life, you know. Yeah. You get a broken leg, you know when it's going to heal. When you get the flu, you kind of figure it's going to be a couple of days. You get other illnesses. Cancer is war, frankly, right. on your body. Right. And so I was not prepared for that. I lived this long, fortunate life. Everything had gone my way, yeah. even though I intellectually understood what was happening. Right. It was right. hard emotionally to deal with that. Was there a why, there was a why me? Yeah, and so I started keeping a journal because yeah. I'm a journalist and I was home a lot. And I, I was, I was self-educating as well, learning something every day. Yeah. And then I began to realize, given what I was going through, that I could probably help other families by writing, this is what you have to be prepared for. This is how the medical system deals with cancer or doesn't deal with cancer. And I learned some things along the way. And what's been gratifying, Jeff, is that a number of institutions now, including the Mayo Clinic where I'm on the board, have taken the book and they're using it with their staff members to say, this is what we need to do better, communication. Yeah. Families are writing to me saying, oh my God, you're talking exactly about what we want yeah. to So that's important. What, what about the what about the voice of the writer? You know, I mean, you're a broadcaster. You, you had to v develop a right. voice, yeah. right? That was yeah. you. You wrote you write histories. Right. That's a that's a sort of historian voice. You write a memoir. Do you think of it as the same voice or the same kind you? Of. Yeah, kind of. And my yeah. friends, my friends say that they say I can hear you. you yeah. Which is, I must say, that's flattering. Yeah. I'm a big student of literature, and I have been forever. And I didn't have the courage to write a book for a long time because I didn't think I didn't feel I was qualified. I was writing op-ed page pieces, magazine stories, yeah. but a book was yeah. something else entirely. So when I wrote *The Greatest Generation*, you do hear me in it. I even hear me in it. Right. So it's that it was kind of a combination of broadcasting and literary style. Yeah. And I think in uh, the memoir, it's probably. Uh, better defined as those two things uh, because there were some very personal things in there but at the same time I was abstract in a lot of ways yeah. talking about medical systems and what was going on. So. Who were the people that you, who were the writers that you grew up writing and thinking about as a, as a reader? Well, the golden age of post-war American yeah. literature, you yeah. know, it was Philip Roth and Mailer and, yeah. and, uh, and, and you know, uh, all the people that you know that care about David McCullough later was the historian, but yeah. when it came to fiction, we were very excited about who was going to come out with something next. Updike, when's that going to happen? Salinger, right. you know, when's that? When's the next book? And right. you talk about it when you're of a certain age. Yeah. Uh, I just did uh, a, a book for Bill Styron, who's gone now. I right. did the introduction to it, sure. and it was his book of nonfiction about growing up in the South. Yeah. And I'd gotten to know him, and I was very flattered by yeah. that. And when I, but I'd read those guys when I was doing my own writing. I'd want to crawl under the bed and hide because I, I knew I wasn't measuring up. You know, just anything that Roth writes. Or, but were you thinking early on of a, of a writing career before journalism? No, or? I. No. You know, I. What I decided early on that I was probably inclined to be a, a broadcast journalist. Yeah. You know, I have certain talking, speaking skills, yeah. and I, I like the visual aspect of it, yeah. making the small films. Television was the miracle of my teen. I didn't see it until I was 15, and I knew- You didn't see television until you were 15? Yeah. Well, I didn't know that. in such a remote part of South Dakota. Really, yeah. really? So when Huntley Brinkley came on the air at 5.30 at night, I'd come home from basketball practice or football yeah. practice, yeah. and the whole family would sit there, because we would see things we never thought we'd see in our lifetime, right. in our living right. room. Right. And early on, my friends all say, you were talking even then about you wanted to do that someday. And you know, that was launched me from South Dakota. So I so was- it was, a, it was a wider world, right? To, it was, to, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I wanted to get over the horizons, yeah. you know, and see what was going on yeah. out yeah. there. Yeah. And then as I got more and more involved in the early stages of broadcast journalism, uh, the, the, it was peopled by a lot of print folks. You know, they came over to television. Yeah. They became my mentors. And, uh, and when I was in California covering politics, my best friends were reporters for the LA Times. Sure. And 
Johnny Apple would come out and he'd call me up and say, come on, Brokaw, give me a brief on what's going on out right. here. So I had that kind of uh, dual life, if you will, and I think it served me well. Are, do, you, do you miss the uh, daily news? I miss it when there's something big. <laughs> I, I don't. I thought you would say that. Yeah. I miss it when there's something big. But the routine stuff, I don't miss it. I did it for 22 years on yeah. that chair, and I, I had the best time possible yeah. because I not only, you know, I was, I was a young reporter in California in '68, and then at, in '89 when the world came apart, yeah. Dan Peter and I had satellites, and we could jump on the plane and get on the air from anywhere, and it was all breaking loose everywhere right. you know I was in China for Tiananmen Square I was at Berlin Wall the night it came down yeah. you know in Russia when that was happening Velvet Revolution you name it we could go and do it so right. it was very gratifying and, and a, a political campaign I have to ask you because we're in we're at the beginning we're in one again is that wet your appetite or is that no, happier does. to be away it from I'm already thinking about what I want to do in Iowa I'm already thinking about New Hampshire I've been in those places since 1968 yeah. both places yeah but, Actually, Iowa later, New yeah. Hampshire first, and uh, you know it's. Uh, I keep reminding people. I do a little daily radio commentary. I said, "Remember, Pat Robertson won Iowa at one yeah. point, you yeah. know, and George Bush, forty-one, beat Ronald Reagan in Iowa." So you know, start breathing a little more shallow. Yeah. You yeah. know, we're a long way from just playing. our last thirty seconds. What? How, what? How's your health now? I'm in remission, yeah. um, and there's no guarantee, yeah. but I'm feeling good about it. And I, the one thing is that it's a physical cancer, it invades your bone marrow, so I've yeah. got back issues. I had a fair amount of damage to my spine, so I'm spending part of every day repairing that. Tom Brokaw, pleasure to talk Always to you. Always a pleasure, Jeff. Thanks so Enjoy much. Enjoy watching you a lot. Thank you very much.